Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Greetings, everyone. Good day, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. On behalf of Feed the Future and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I welcome you to our webinar, Why Inclusion Matters, Voices from the Field. I am your host and friendly neighborhood senior knowledge management advisor, Zachary Bakke, with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I will facilitate today's webinar, so you will hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer sessions. Before we dive into the content, let us take a moment to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself, ask questions, and share resources with uh, other participants, um, us and other participants. We will collect your questions from the chat box throughout the webinar. We will have our Q&A after the presenters and panelists have spoken. The speakers will also answer some questions in chat box along the way, perhaps. To a larger screen, uh, as you might note, we have a uh, closed caption down below, and that uh, shrinks the size of the, the overall presenter screen. Um, if you want to enlarge the screen, you can click on the arrows in the upper right of your screen, the four arrows that are uh, pointing outwards. This will in make the presentation larger. You can then click on the arrows again to shrink it back to normal and see the full screen. Lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we will email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once we have them ready. We will also post these resources on the event page on agrilinks.org. Thank you for your attention. Now onwards to our presentations and discussions for today's webinar, Why Inclusion Matters, Voices from the Field. Let me introduce um, Meredith Sewell, who serves as Division Chief for the Inclusive Development Division within the Program Office of the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Meredith Sewell will introduce the session and the speakers. Over to you, Meredith. Thank you, Zachary, and good morning, noon or night, to our global community. Welcome to this webinar for wrapping up our AgriLinks Month on Inclusive Development. We're thrilled today to have presentations on two important recent reports. On first, Building Inclusive Food Systems from IFPRI, presented by Agnes Kisumbing. And second, Inclusion Matters in Africa, a groundbreaking report by Maitre Das from the World Bank. I'm sure that these brief presentations will whet your appetite to read and make use of these reports, and you'll find links to them in the AgriLinks invitation for this webinar, and I've seen they've also put those links in the chat box. We know that inclusion always matters, but also recognize it is even more important in our COVID and post-COVID world to come to ensure that no one is marginalized or left behind. After those two presentations, we're very excited to have a group of panelists from literally around the world to reflect on how inclusion matters in their countries and contexts and the actions they're taking to improve inclusion and therefore well-being for all. Briefly, our panelists are first Betty Mugo. She's with USAID Kenya and East Africa, where she's a gender and inclusivity specialist. She'll be followed by Manju Tuladhar with USAID Nepal, a gender equality and social inclusion advisor. Then from USAID Guatemala, we'll have Hersa Morales, a project management specialist. And finally, Emmanuel Ndayizigye, a co-founder and chief executive officer of Horico, Horticulture in Reality Corporation I'm in Rwanda with a focus on youth. Um, and after that, Q&A. So with that, I'll turn the screen over to Agnes to begin the webinar with her presentation. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Meredith, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to present IFPRI's Global Food Policy Report 2020, which is on building food, inclusive food systems for all. Um, as you may know, the Global Food Policy Report is IFPRI's flagship publication which draws on the work of IFPRI researchers all over the world. Why are inclusive food systems important? They're important because they promote inclusive economic growth, 
by better integrating marginalized people into national food systems. They can help to reduce poverty by increasing household incomes and improving access to services. They also help to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. They reduce global and national inequalities. And in a world where existing inequalities and disparities are magnified by COVID, inclusion is a moral imperative. Um, many of you know that most of my work um, recently has been on gender. And it is a very important factor that mediates a person's inclusion in food systems. We often talk about involving women in food systems, but women are actually already involved in food systems. The question is the extent to which they benefit and the extent to which food systems allow them to make strategic life choices. So building inclusive food systems means not making sure that they reach women, but also they are ben that they benefit and are empowered. What are the instruments, mechanisms, and policies for inclusion? I'm going to go through these four instruments and mechanisms for inclusion, paying attention to the role of gender in each of these. This is especially crucial during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it should, that attention should really be there every day. OK, so let's start with inclusive food value chains, especially for smallholders. And this is the hidden middle. Running small off-farm agri-food businesses is already highly profitable. Uh, per worker income in this part of the food value chain is much higher than farm income and can even pay off more than non-food activity. And many such businesses exist in food supply chains in Africa and Asia. Therefore, policymakers should see the potential for their growth and future development. How can they be more inclusive? We recommend three priority types of support that governments can provide. First, improved infrastructure and access to finance. Such support will be more inclusive if this benefits SME processors, distributors, and transporters that connect to supply chains between rural areas and small urban areas. Second, publicly certified food standards and price incentives are needed so that SMEs can meet higher quality and food safety standards of consumers and be better able to compete in domestic markets and also to connect to global value chains. Third, their education policies. Basic education is important, but also professional training to improve entrepreneurship, knowledge of ICT and food safety and quality standards. I think after COVID, nobody needs to remind us about food safety. But throughout all these, we need to pay attention to particular barriers that marginalized people face and the intersectionality of those barriers. For example, a woman may be disadvantaged not only because she's a woman, but because she faced barriers owing to race, race, ethnicity, and social class. So social protection is an important mechanism for safeguarding the food and nutrition security for marginalized people. They can help fulfill basic calorie and nutrient needs and prevent malnutrition. Attention to gender dynamics can also make them more effective, for example, by targeting women as recipients and providing nutrition behavior change communication in social protection programs. Education is probably the greatest driver of inclusion, but barriers to education still exist. Vocational training isn't a cure-all either because barriers to participation, irrelevant content, and inadequate reach all limit effectiveness. Technology innovations can reduce information asymmetries and improve accountability. But we need to look at access to technology as well. There are many inequalities that deter the, the potential of education to be a driver of inclusion. What is key behind all this? We need governance, good governance, and good leadership. They are key for inclusive food systems, especially for marginalized people. Excluded people need to be represented in positions of leadership. So for example, in one of our studies in, an air, in, in five states of India with a high proportion of tribal population, we found that women SHG members are more likely to be aware of and to participate in government entitled schemes. So the self-help group movements have helped to give women a voice 
and to make the local governments more accountable. We also need to leverage evidence and data in politics and governance. We can take advantage of big data, but we should be aware that there are also gaps in terms of access to ICTs. For example, worldwide, more than 393 million women do not have access to mobile phones, and this gap is bigger in some areas. Poor people's food and nutrition security is disproportionately affected by COVID-19, and let's not forget the gendered impacts. Poor people are more affected because um, of first effects on income, the large share of income spent on food, the reliance on physical labor to generate income. It may also cause more disruptions in poor people's value chains. Public food and nutrition programs may be disrupted, and the fiscal capacity of governments to fund support programs is lower in poor countries. The disruption of social protection programs is especially crucial for poor women. Transfer programs are a very important outside option that's linked to increases in bargaining power for women, whether through conditional cash transfer programs or unconditional cash transfer programs. But a rapid assessment of the initial COVID-19 social protection response by Melissa Hidrobo and others at IFPRI show that only 11% show some limited gender sensitivity. So more needs to be work, more needs to be done. We need to do better here. That said, um, we need inclusive food systems now more than ever. They can help to address inclusion at the global policy level. They can help us take action at the national level. At the national level. And they can also take into account the fact that these systems are very, very different. It's very different across countries and contexts. Similarly, gendered impacts require gender-sensitive policy responses. Gender norms are context-specific, so should policy responses be. Some options can be considered given what we know about women's vulnerabilities. These include cash transfers targeted to women to smooth consumption. Insurance programs can help women preserve their asset base and build up assets again during recovery because evidence from past crises has shown us that women's assets are often the first to be disposed of when a crisis hits. Responses need to pay attention to women's role as caregivers, which is often undervalued and unrecognized. I think the whole debate, even in the United States, about going back to school recognizes that without good child care, women cannot go back to work. We must also pay attention to men's vulnerabilities, not just physical or health-wise, but social. Increased stress is highly correlated with domestic violence. A recent, worker that just came, a, a recent working paper that just came out on India shows that the location of gender-based violence has shifted from outside the home to within the home after the lockdown. Policy, policy should also help girls stay in school and to avoid early marriage. So IFPRI has a blog series on COVID-19 and food security, and it goes through a range of um, different topics. And if you want to read more on, on this, go to the blog on the IFPRI website. But we will also be launching our ebook on COVID-19 and global food security on Tuesday, August 4 at 9.30 a.m. Announcements should be coming out soon. So finally, um, check out the IFPRI website for the full text of the 2020 Global Food Policy Report. Thank you very much. And I will pass this on now to Maitreyi. Hello, can everybody hear me? Um, okay, fantastic. Um, good morning and good evening, everybody. It is a real pleasure to be here. And um, I, I re am really looking forward to this really important discussion on, um, on inclusion um, after that wonderful presentation that Agnes just made. Um, let me give you a little bit of a background uh, to what I'm speaking to. So. Um, 
many years ago, in 2013, we came up with our flagship report on inclusion, on social inclusion. So the, the picture that you see on the right is actually a painting, so actually both the paintings are from the same Ugandan artist, uh, Mukasa, and uh, that's the cover of our first report, and you can download that if you type Inclusion Matters plus World Bank. And the sequel, almost, um, that came out last year was Inclusion Matters in Africa, and that's the, the larger picture. And if you type Inclusion Matters in Africa plus World Bank, you should be able to get to that as well. So I'm going to speak a bit to, to this, and the reason why this is so important today is because COVID-19 is, in a sense, amplifying existing structural inequalities and forms of exclusion. And if we have a better understanding of what was happening in terms of the social structures prior to COVID-19, it will help us to, to have a better response and to be able to have a more informed response to, to the pandemic and to the recovery efforts. So why, why did we do this report now? We did this report because as a continent, which of course, as we know, is a highly heterogeneous continent, um, but there are certain demographic, economic, spatial, political, climate, and other trends that are completely re-imaging the African reality. And I'll tell you a little bit uh, as to how that's happening. So, um, and and so, what did we do? How did we how did we come upon, come upon this report? We didn't collect any any new data. We actually used a tool that we had created after Inclusion Matters. It's called the Social Inclusion Assessment Tool. You can also download that. It's a four-question methodology, and we use those to frame questions. We built on existing analysis on inclusion and synthesized existing evidence, used data from a number of different surveys that you're all probably familiar with. But we realized that given the heterogeneity and the vast number of issues that exist in Africa, it is very difficult to come up with a synthetic report that does justice to all parts of the, the great continent. Um, so let me walk you through some of the important messages in the report. First message is that Africa has seen some of the fastest progress towards social inclusion in the past few decades. And in some cases, Africa has moved faster at a pace faster than we have seen ever globally. The second point that we, we make in the report is that despite this incredible progress and this incredible move towards social inclusion, some groups and areas have been left out of the program, and they continue to remain at risk. So social inclusion as a, as a conceptual category or as a concept helps us to understand who's left out and from what, in what ways, and why. And that's what SEAT, our social inclusion assessment tool, asks us to do. Messages three, four, and five. Um, first, the messages, message three is that social inclusion draws attention not just to poverty, but to the drivers of poverty. And it also explains that poverty reduction alone is not enough to end the exclusion of some individuals and, and groups. The fourth message we have is that there are certain structures and processes that aid and abet exclusion, that magnify exclusion, and that help in maintaining the status quo which, which exacerbates exclusion. Often, these have got historical and cultural roots. Our fifth message is that areas that are affected by conflict and fragility stand out as having the poorest outcomes in many aspects related to social inclusion. And conversely, peace and security do matter for social inclusion. The final two messages that we have is that uh, the societies incur significant costs from social exclusion. But achieving inclusion also has its costs. So you hear people often say it's a win-win. In the long run, it's a win-win. But there are investments that countries and societies need to make towards inclusion. It is not a free good. And that's why it has to be a conscious choice for states and societies especially as they walk through some of the costs and benefits, the, the losers and winners of inclusion. Finally, with a strong social con contract, social inclusion is within reach in Africa, and hundreds of experiences and initiatives across the continent demonstrate this. So just going through a quick primer on what we consider to be social inclusion. This is our, our definition. We call it the process of improving the terms for individuals and groups to take part in society. 
And when, when we talk about it in a little bit more detail, we say it's the process of improving the ability, opportunity, and dignity of people who are disadvantaged because of their identity to take part in society. It's a bit of a mouthful, but if you take each of these words, it has a specific meaning, and much of it is contextual. Um, then we ask inclusion in what and how. So this is our this is the conceptual framework. We say inclusion in markets, which could be land markets, labor markets, credit markets, services, not just services like water and sanitation and, and transport, but services like information technology, like childcare. And then spaces, and the idea of spaces is a somewhat physical, we could talk about physical space, but we also talk about something which is more more normative, with more, more conceptual, like, like more almost metaphysical, so cultural spaces, how much space does the culture have. And, and at the bottom of it is to enhance ability, opportunity, and dignity. What are the faces of exclusion in Africa? And we heard, we heard um, Agnes talk about the, the disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged woman who is disadvantaged not just because she's a woman, but because she has many other identities. So think about uh, a woman that comes from a, a minority ethnic group that lives in a faraway location that also has a disability. That intersectionality, that, that overlay of identities confers the kind of exclusion that we would not expect, for instance, a rich woman living in a city um, who is educated to have. So the, the intersectionality and the context is extremely important. So what are the long-term trends that are affecting inclusion in Africa? First of all, Africa is the fastest urbanizing con continent. It is the least urbanized right now, but in terms of the pace of urbanization, Africa is going to see the fastest urbanization. Besides, half the population of Africa is under 25 years old. So there's both an urbanization demographic trend as well as a, the age structure of the population is quite distinct in Africa. Um, then there are access to services in Africa. So you have on, on the one hand you have electricity and on the other hand you have water. And this is just to give you a sense of the great heterogeneity that exists in Africa. And despite the fact that there has been very dramatic improvement in both energy access, so electricity access and water access, in fact, there are countries that have seen both very little progress as well as very little coverage in both, uh, in both water and in electricity. Um, let's take the idea of let's take technology. Uh, Africa is one of the areas which has seen some of the most dramatic uh, innovation as far as technology is concerned. And yet, if you take a look at smartphone usage, and this becomes so important in the days of COVID, where everything is happening through smartphones, uh, take a look. Uh, so if you take a look at gender, at age, at education status, they really determine who is using smartphones. And now I'm going to go a bit faster because I realize I have very little time. Um, also in terms of education, if you take a look at education, you find there's a dramatic improvement, but then persons with disabilities tend to get left out. Um, I'm going to go very quickly through this. Um, in terms of, of persons who are displaced by conflict, Africa is the country where, that has seen the greatest amount of, of displacement in the last few years. Then we go into uh, perceptions and attitudes, which matter a great deal, because social, inclusion, social exclusion is rooted in these processes. Um, let's take a look at this from the World Value Survey. Okay? Um, whom would you not like to have as a neighbor? The World Value Survey actually has very few African countries represented in it. But this, these graphs are important not for what they are showing in terms of exclusion, but what it's telling you is that Africa is not such an exceptional place. It looks very much like other places in terms of, in terms of um, the level of, say, xenophobia or in terms of the level of whom would you not like to have as, as a neighbor. It looks very similar. So this whole idea about there's certain exceptionalism about Africa is actually not true because we find that African countries tend to be very, very similar to other countries. Similarly, you find people saying about Africa that, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of ethnic identity that people tend to focus on. Actually, we find that people, the people that are they're surveyed by the Afrobarometer tend to be equally uh, invested in their ethnic as well as their national identity. And you can take a look at these graphs later as well. The other thing we found very interestingly through many
any surveys is that despite a lot of challenges that African countries, respondents from African countries tend to be, tend to show the greatest hope and, and optimism. Um, did I lose something? Are you still hearing me? Uh, okay. Um, Africa also shows, uh, could you just type in the chat pod, Adam, if you're hearing me? Maitri, we can hear you well. Um, can you speak up just a little bit louder because some of our audience was having issues hearing you clearly. So just uh, enunciate as much as you can and project. Oh. Is, this, is this better? Uh, it is, okay. yeah. Okay, excellent. So um, I, I apologize for that, but I, I hope that it is um, it, it's better now. Africa shows us many many pathways towards inclusion, inclusion, and um, and I'm going to run you through a few of them. So, for instance, some of the most dramatic reform of laws towards gender equality have taken place recently in Africa. Um, certain norms and behaviors that were considered to be immutable, such as female gender cutting, have seen some of the most dramatic improvements in African countries. Again, I mentioned innovation. So, for instance, of course, we know about M-Pesa in, in Kenya, but there's a whole generation of social safety net programs where innovations are taking place in African countries. And finally, social movements, which are so important in pushing change towards social inclusion, we are seeing some of the most dramatic social movements, such as for towards disability, against gender-based violence, um, for climate, youth-based movements that are taking place in, in, um, in African countries. This is a, a very interesting graph that shows Burkina Faso and, and the quite, uh, quite interesting decline in female genital cutting across cohorts. Um, finally, so I, I'm hoping that I will I will stay within my allotted 12 to 15 minutes. So what what does this report try to do? So what the report actually does is that it places the notion of social inclusion front and center in, a, in, in an analysis of what Africa has achieved and where the challenges are. To our knowledge, this is the first report that puts it within the overall category of inclusion that goes beyond poverty. So it's not just about poverty. Second, it takes an interdisciplinary approach. And it brings empirical weight to issues that are already being debate, debated in the realm of advocacy and in the realm of contestation. It addresses with greater granularity who is left out, from what are they left out, and how are they left out. Um, it further uses the ex experience of African countries to show that Africa's challenges in social inclusion are not unique and they're not exceptional. It also shows that other countries outside of Africa can learn from many of the innovations that are taking place in Africa, where some African countries are actually first movers in many different innovations across the board. It shows us the channels through which the costs of social exclusion obtained. So we have a table that shows the costs of exclusion and which are the pathways through which these costs get amplified. Um, it talks about innovation. And then it sheds light on areas where deeply entrenched norms and practices have actually changed. Because we hear a lot of people saying, oh, this is about norms, this is about culture, it's very difficult to change. We are actually seeing that change happen. So people who say, oh, norms are hard to change, it's, that's not necessarily the case. Yes, they may be hard to change, but they do change. And then it asserts that social inclusion needs to be a conscious choice. It doesn't just happen. Sometimes it does just happen accidentally, but for the most part, it needs to be a social contract um, on the basis of which governments and non-state actors can move forward. Um, let me stop there. Uh, and thank you very much. If you're live tweeting, please use the hashtag uh, inclusion matters. Thank you. And um, I need to hand it to uh, Manju. I'm sorry, I think I, I messed that one up. Problem, we're actually going to stop for okay. questions. Uh, Zachary, over to you. Okay. Thank you um, so much.
Thank you both very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. And so I will start with the first question from uh, Indra Klein on, for Agnes. With regard to social protection programs, to what degree, if any, does cultural mores impact such? Thank you for this really interesting question. Um, I think um, social protection programs need to be designed to take into account the specific cultural mores where they're being implemented. Um, this is so that, one, that they're feasible to implement, and secondly, that you don't risk uh, any backlash. So in many, so in many social protection programs, there has been the trend to, tra to target them to women, because especially SP programs, which are designed to improve child health and nutrition. And these have, by and large, been quite successful. Um, of course, with, with variations. What we've found that's quite interesting is that if you combine um, a be nutrition behavior change communication with um, cash transfer programs, you might have an additional effect. So my colleagues in Bangladesh um, tested combining nutrition BCC with a food or a cash transfer in, in an RCT, and what they found was that not only was the arm with the nutrition BCC more effective, that you also had reductions in intimate partner violence in those treatment arms. The other interesting thing is that sometimes you, you, you really need to be aware of what's culturally feasible. So the same set of colleagues, um, Melissa Hidrobo, Shalini Roy, um, they were evaluating a transfer program in Mali um, where the government um, thought that it was not politically feasible to target the woman specifically. So they targeted to the head of the household. Um, and in many cases, this, is, this was a male. But what they found was that it also reduced intimate partner violence in polygamous households. So I think when you, when you design a social protection program, you really have to be aware of the potential impact on inter-household relations. But you can also be transformative and try to use the program to tweak um, you know, to move gender norms to become more transformative, in, in a sense. Okay, thank you very much, Agnes. Um, this question, the next question, just one more, uh, comes from Ashok Sarkar, uh, and it's for Maitri. Uh, do we need to pay special attention for the climate vulnerable for better inclusion? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that, please? I didn't hear that, that last part. Do we exactly. need to uh, um, do we need to pay special attention for the climate vulnerable for better inclusion? Absolutely, I think that uh, the the fact of climate change is something that uh, that is a reality. We are seeing it across. Uh, we're seeing it globally, and in Africa in particular, we're seeing. Uh, a uh, sort of a, an upsurge of extreme weather events, for instance, uh, that are are leading to certain groups being disproportionately affected. For instance, there were floods in in Mozambique. Um, there was um, there were there were uh, the hurricanes. There was Kenneth. There was Ida, and we found that uh, there are certain groups that tend to be much more uh, much more disproportionately affected because maybe they're residing on the peripheries of the city, maybe they're new migrants, maybe they're living in housing that, uh, that is easily blown away, um, maybe they have lost livelihoods. But then it doesn't have to be just poor people. It's often a lot of, um, a, a lot of people that are, say, take the, a person with a disability that lives in a rich household. If there is a flood, that person with a disability, regardless of living, living in a rich household, is going to find it very difficult to, to move around. So there is a certain way in which identity affects, um, affects you through the climate route as well, particularly through extreme weather events, but not only through extreme weather events. Thank you, Zachary. Thank you both, um, and appreciate uh, you answering those questions. And now we'll move on to the panel section, and so I will hand it over to Betty Mugo um, for her comments. Her. Thank you very much, 
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from all the places that you're all joining us from. For those who are outside Kenya, please allow me to welcome you virtually to Kenya. Here, we are truly authentic, and inclusion does matter. I start off by asking, what does inclusion mean to you? And does it matter, and why? To me, inclusion is not just about being seen, but it's also about being heard. It matters because it empowers individuals, groups, and communities to make a difference. So how did we here in USA, Kenya, and East Africa make this happen? A little over a year ago, USA, Kenya, and East Africa started to develop the next five-year country development cooperative strategy. We reviewed multiple analytics that guided our conversations. The data started to shape up into key themes and messages around Kenya's development challenges. We knew what the data was saying, and now we needed to hear what Kenyans thought about this data and what it meant to them. So we went out with these data messages and began to ask Kenyans across the country, Kenyans that were drawn from public sector, from private sector, from civil society, and Kenyans living with disabilities, what they thought about the data. What did the data mean to each of them? We then conducted a gender analysis and again talked to government officials. We spoke to elders, to adolescent girls, to teen mothers, to morans, and this is a term that we use here for young men, and to representatives from key populations. Throughout all these consultations, we gathered data that helped us to understand the complex yet interconnected and sometimes hidden challenges in Kenya. The data helped us to see a much fuller picture, which is what you see depicted here in this tree. At the root of Kenya's development challenges is chronic conflict that is entrenched by ethnic divisions and harmful gender norms. This then shrunk into what you see as a branch into persistent poverty that is exacerbated by pervasive corruption and in turn leads to inadequate systems. However, what is visible and obvious to many of us, and particularly here in Kenya, is the youth unemployment, the abuse and vulnerability of adolescent girls, the slowing growth and the declining natural resources. So we would not have had this clarity here in Kenya if we had not listened and included Kenyans in our strategy development. And for us, we learned that data does matter because it has led USAID, Kenya, and East Africa to be practical and to make crucial evidence-based decisions. The data has mattered because by including Kenyans, they are now able to lead and own their own development uh, journey. In fact, one of the most significant decisions that USAID, Kenya, and East Africa has made is investing in evidence-based solutions, as we can see through our Partnership for Resilience and Economic Growth, which has been rehabilitating and constructing over 40 physical markets in northern Kenya. Now, northern Kenya has a terrain that's not only harsh, but it's vast, and communities are dispersed across remote areas. These markets are beginning to increase access and leading to more people and communities to engage in economic activities. These places of trade have become vibrant and are able to connect people together, enhancing not just trade but also increasing incomes and the economic prosperity in these communities. Today, women, men, young people are meeting to trade in these places of trade and they trade in livestock, in food, in clothing, in supplies, and even in artifacts. But they are also now able to access services such as transport, motor vehicle and motorcycle repair shops, as well as mobile money agents. Households are now able to access diverse foods and therefore improve the household nutrition. Today, these places of trade are not only just inclusive, but they also are safe and they have become reliable. Local 
market committees are also now managing this market. And together with the county government and other partners, these markets also provide other amenities like water because the markets are now also able to generate their own income. Now, even while COVID-19 has disrupted and interrupted activities in the market and depressed the sales, these markets for sure remain important hubs for linking our communities and our people together and enabling them to remain included uh, in the economic activities of their communities. I will end here and allow me to now welcome my colleague, Dr. Manju, from U.S. State, Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reddy. Hello and namaste, everyone. Um, I'm speaking from Nepal, so I'll start by talking about what inclusion means in the context of Nepal. So as you know, inclusion is the reciprocal relationship between people and institutions. People through the interactions shape the institutions also called the formal and informal rules of the game. In reality, it is people with more power and influence who shape the rules of the game in their favor and perpetuate the dominance. Let me cite an example, representation of women and marginalized groups in all the political and state institutions is assured by law. However, there's a high level of patronage and women normally get the weakest position. So it is the informal institutions like gender, caste, kinship, or political networks, which are more powerful than the formal institutions. The informal institutions are harder for outsiders to see and understand because they are often invisible. Also, informal institutions require attitudinal change to recognize power imbalances and shift the existing rules of the game that currently determine who is included or excluded. Importantly, we must understand the intersections of the various markers of difference as multiple identities intersect to form overlapping layers of discrimination. Intersecting differences by gender, caste, ethnicity, or minority status has led to many groups and individuals in Nepal being placed at the bottom for generations, and they are deprived from exercising their fundamental rights and freedom. So how does USAID Nepal implement inclusion? We start with JESSE analysis for every project designed to identify barriers. By design, we mandate our partners to conduct activity-specific JESSE analysis and action plans, based on which reporting is done. Our Fit the Future activities are guided by this process of integrating inclusion in the project management. And it is useful for setting the priorities and measuring the inclusion results. In spite of it, we face challenges in integration, since not all partners have uniform understanding, ownership, and commitment to address inclusion issues. The role of USAID EORs and CORs is very important, and without the buy-in and support to the partners, it is a challenge to manage inclusive results. USAID also focuses on open culture. Open culture has to be understood by all staff because inclusion is both a collective and institutional effort. Now I want to talk about how our projects enhance inclusion. Most of our partners start by doing the JESSE analysis to understand the underlying drivers of exclusion. For example, researching the implications of technology and the effects on women and identifying their particular needs. Inclusion-specific interventions are varied, such as bringing the project inputs and solutions at a time and place suitable for women farmers, enhancing women's knowledge and access to improved technologies and markets, targeting businesses led by women to build their social and economic capital. Examples of targeting include allocating resources, at least one-third, like grants to businesses led by marginalized women, targeting women-led cooperatives, and assuring women have sufficient knowledge and market linkages. However, women are not always given respect and support by family and community, and it can be a challenge to ensure a safe or respectful work environment. Projects also ensure women farmers benefit from inclusive policies intended to benefit them and advocate for female-targeted farm mechanization policies. 
in spite of all these scaling positive gains or transformations is challenging. So what are the results? You will say it's accountability to address discrimination and reduce social disparities is a key result, I would say. Also, it obliges partners to do the same. Our partners are working in the systems or institutions, and this is increasing the chain reaction of capacity building, partnerships, access to resources by women and marginalized groups. We are seeing results in increased business literacy skills, influencing local governments to remove social barriers, influencing government subsidy programs to, for example, make farm machinery more affordable for female-headed households. I want to share a small story about women empowerment. The context is that female farmers lack access to agricultural knowledge and technology. So 101 lead female farmers were trained in quality seed production and linked with seed companies for marketing. And the result is the removal of knowledge and market barriers. Now in the other picture, the gender gap is agricultural, agriculture extension services are highly male dominated, even though the farmers are overly female. Over 100 local young women were trained, and the result is that women farmers' participation increased, and the access to knowledge services and decision making also increased. The seed companies, on the other hand, can focus on branding and marketing, while production is taken care of by the women-led cooperatives. One company even named four varieties of tomato after the women to recognize their special skills. I'll end my presentation here. Thank you. So now I'll pass on the um, you know, plenary to uh, Herson. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here today and talk about uh, the work the Guatemalan mission is doing and also the City Future, activi uh, the City Future activities uh, regarding inclusion. Just to give you a, a, a quick context about some of the challenges in Guatemala, perhaps some of you are already familiar with this data. However, uh, it is worth, I think, mentioning to, just to give us an idea how to tackle all the root uh, causes or issues when it comes to inclusion. Uh, Guatemala's chronic malnutrition rates are concentrated, concentrated primarily among the poor and indigenous people. 59% of the population lives in poverty, 79% of which are indigenous people and also extreme inequality and social exclusion, which stratifies society along indigenous, non-indigenous, uh, rural, urban, and gender lines. This is what they compound, uh, compound the problem. And last, uh, one of the issues that is being dramatically in, in, has increased in the last few years is illegal immigration, mainly to the United States. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and especially among the youth group, uh, this is like I would say this is the, the, the more vulnerable, vulnerable population for illegal immigration. So based on these challenges I just mentioned here, uh, there, is a clear, there is a clear path, but also we, we see that there are a lot of obstacles to defeat in order to achieve our results. That is why for the Guatemala mission, inclusion is one of the, one of the key priorities to achieve social and economic development results. Um, however, in many cases, we have experienced that when we talk about and work with cross-cutting activities, such as uh, uh, when we talk about uh, inclusion, uh, sorry, uh, when we talk about and work with cross-cutting activities such as youth, women, indigenous group, etc., somehow the results are not very clear, or sometimes they get lost among our activities. And at the end of the, the day, we don't really get the results as we anticipated or as we planned. For example, I'm going to give you a clear example. Under the Future, future Activities, the percentage of females participating under economic programs, productive economic uh, programs, is around 30%, and this is a similar percentage for youth. And when it comes to working with indigenous, indigenous communities, it's around 45%. So if we really want positive results, uh, I think putting a lot of effort, time, and investment, 
and focus on these activities, I believe we could achieve or make great progress. In Guatemala, under one of the city future activities, uh, which is called the Coffee Value Change Project, we have created an interest tool, the interesting tool called the Learning Path, or Rutas de Aprendizaje in Spanish. Actually, this, uh, if you want to learn more about the Rutas de Aprendizaje or Learning Path, it's, uh, it was recently posted on AgriLinks. Uh, so the, the Ruta of the Aprendizaje or Learning Path is a community space where farmers can strengthen in their knowledge and exchange experiences. And each learning path has at least three types of learning stations. For example, it could be coffee production, it could be nutrition activities, and this is where we, uh, we work a lot on nutrition-sensitive agriculture activities as well. And also we have some adaptation to climate change uh, activities. And all of these stations uh, in the learning path, uh, gender equity and social inclusion are, uh, we consider them well taken, especially indigenous people and youth are like the, the are essential part of, the, of this approach. Moving to the next slide, uh, as you can see in the photos, uh, a group of women are working with coffee processing. Also, uh, you can see uh, uh, youth working with animal youth for chicken chicken meat and egg production, and women learning how to use digital tools for agriculture. The next slide uh, shows us how projects empower, or how projects are empowering women and youth through nutrition-sensitive agriculture activities, which is an essential part of the learning path I mentioned before, where women and their families have access to more nutritious food, and they are also trained also to prepare more balanced meals. And moving to the next slide. Uh, and finally, we think that uh, a way or strategy to engage and empower youth into agriculture production or nutrition sensitive agriculture activities is through the use of digital tools. For example, one of the Feed the Future activities called ProInnova, implemented by a local agribusiness uh, company called Popoyam, has developed a tool, a digital tool called Agro AgriConnecta. And this is an open tool that can be used and can be basically uh, uh, integrated into your cell phone for anyone. And we have seen a uh, special attraction for youth, youth entrepreneurs or farmers for the use of this, uh, uh, this app. This application has been a very interesting tool, as I mentioned before, to receive technical assistance or if you want to market uh, your agriculture products. And finally, as one of my implemented partner mentioned, inclusion in Guatemala is about achieving balance and providing equal opportunities for indigenous groups, women, men, and youth to achieve a sustainable development. Also, inclusion requires a strong social and economic changes that must be pursued through the improvement of knowledge, training, and socialization activities among small farmers and their families, communities, local governments, including even the private sector when some, sometimes we think it's the, the, the hardest sector to, to achieve or, or make them to work in the inclusion side. So thank you very much. I hope this presentation was, uh, was useful, and I hand it over to my colleague, Emmanuel. My name is Ndaizige Emmanuel. I am from Rwanda, so then I'm going to share you the contribution of Horeco in transforming Rwandan economy through agriculture. Uh, I don't know if you are hearing from me. Okay, so let me... We can oh, hear you. Yes, um, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, Zachary. I was saying that I'm going to share you the contribution of Horeco in transforming Rwandan economy through agriculture. Uh, so Horticulture in Reality Corporation is a big youth organization of 93 professionals in agriculture, created by Samo Agro Studies Internship Program, Arumini, who underwent into 11 mass practical training in Israel. So, as you may know, the governments of Rwanda and Israel collaborate to train the qualified engineers 
in a matter of horticulture development, irrigation, mechanization, and the other agricultural related fields. Then upon coming to the training from Israel, we met and said, hey guys, why can't we meet and uh, start the small business which can generate the income from ourselves and also how we can valorize those skills from academia, from Israel, and help the farmers to boost the agricultural production. Then the idea came and we started from small land where we have been starting to produce the different vegetables like watermelon, like cherries for red pot, like onions for local market, and the other vegetables. I remember uh, Horeko, we started number of 10 where the women uh, was one, where we, we had one girl, and also nine boys. But later on this time, the Horeko, we are around 93 young engineers, where 60% are, are men and 40% are men. Then upon the, that project successful, the government leaders, different stakeholders came and have been asking us, hey guys, you are succeeding in your own project where you are producing different vegetables. Why can't you come and uh, you approach these farmers, you approach your parents, so that also themselves they can start producing as you are producing good quality of vegetables. Then uh, we got another chance to have the, the second project called Operation Maintenance and Management of Irrigation Scheme. In this project, we are helping the farmers, uh, like uh, three clusters, or if I, I can call them. One is for co-production and value chain management. The second is about capacity building and the community mobilization. Lastly, is about the irrigation technology, where we are helping the farmers to boost the irrigation, whether uh, in, a, uh, in a dry season or any other uh, season where we don't have enough rain. So in this second project, we are coaching around 50,000 farmers uh, who are growing different crops on 10,037 hectares. And also among these farmers, we are having different youth uh, companies, different youth uh, cooperatives, uh, different uh, women uh, organizations, so that they are trying also to boost the agricultural production as we have been uh, uh, doing in our starting days. Then upon these uh, successful stories, we got another uh, uh, chance of having the third project through the agreement with AGRA. I know you know some of you, you know AGRA, Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, where we are helping different farmers who are growing um, uh, Irish, po Irish potatoes to produce pre-basic, basic, basic uh, potato seeds. So that we help them to boost the good quality yield in different regions of the country. So this time Horeco is doing different projects as a affirmation where the young we are having, where the women, where the men, uh, 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 we are working together to increase the, our service income and also to help the farmers to boost the agricultural production. So I can invite everyone here to come in Rwanda to visit the, the country. Normally, the agricultural things, I cannot say them here in four point. It will be good to meet you on field to see what we are doing and how we are getting those income. So no agriculture, no food, and no food, no life. May God bless you. May God bless my lovely country, Rwanda, and the Rwandan people. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, everyone, all the presenters and the panelists for your excellent presentations. It has generated quite a lot of uh, questions uh, in the chat box. Um, we thank you for joining us, and now we'll move on to the Q&A session. Uh, and with that, I will ask uh, a question from uh, Abdu Bashir um, to uh, Morales uh, of our panel. Uh, you mentioned chronic malnutrition. Is malnutrition uh, leading to exclusion or uh, exclusion leads to malnutrition? So is malnutrition leading to exclusion or exclusion leading to malnutrition? 
Thank you. I think my responding to Abdul uh, question, I on my own perception, I think it's more exclusion that leads to malnutrition. As explained before, poverty it's uh, highly extreme in mainly in world communities, and that includes, uh, you know, in Guatemala historically, it's been, there's been a lot of uh, conflict and poverty is one of them. Access to to education it's it's one of them as well. So that's kind of like uh, uh, worsening the situation when it comes to economic opportunities, and that leads to, to sometimes, uh, in most cases, to, to have access to more nutritious food. So I would say, uh, the, uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, yeah, I would say the, the, the poverty, that's what leads to nutrition. That's my main perception in Guatemala. Over. OK. Thank you. Um, Next, I would uh, pose a question to Gerson, Emma, and Maju uh, from Sujata Singh. Um, social norm and gendered nature of child care giving role points towards uh, women as the biggest barrier for women to become agricultural extension workers. If any panelists can share ground uh, examples on addressing these issues from the inclusion perspective. Anyone from the panel? Thoughts? Yeah. Um, hi, this is Manju. I would like to um, say yeah. that. Uh, I think. Sorry? Oh, go ahead. OK. So um, working on the, um, you know, women, uh, particularly on the um, marginalized women or low win low income women, have particular needs, especially these can be called uh, strategic or per, uh, practical needs. So unless women's practical needs are uh, addressed, it will be hard to, uh, you know, move the women towards um, upward lines of empowerment. So yeah, Sujata, you are right that they're, they're, those those come as a as a barrier in the beginning. And projects have, um, you know, many of our activities have started looking into the um, um, difficulties of um, uh, leaving their home in certain times or um, uh, leaving um, household chores for other uh, things like meeting and training. So uh, projects have adapted their, um, their, their, you know, where they do the activities, um, whom they invite, where they invite. So. Um, minimum adjustments need to be done. So uh, that, that is only one, one uh, thing. But the other ways that projects have done is also to ask the women, like how they would like to participate. And you know, the, what is the first thing they would like to be supported with in order for them to participate? Um, I would say listening and engaging with the women, but also with broader other community members in order to make it more helpful for the women to participate in spite of the barriers. So uh, some have talked about engaging with the power holders. So power holders are at home. This could be your mother-in-law, could be the elderly in the, in the, in the household, or it could be um, you know, the men. Uh, so engaging with them and getting their support uh, have been some of the strategies used by our activities. I'll stop there uh, for others to chime in. Anyone else want to add? Yes, um, maybe also to give some examples from Kenya. One of the things that we have seen is that uh, a lot of communities have got very uh, firmly held uh, cultural norms and beliefs about what particularly adolescent girls or young women can do and, and, and should do and, and, and those things that they can't do. And one of the things we've been trying to do is also to work with adolescent girls and young women to empower them, to speak up for themselves, but also to speak for others. Uh, and we do this through mentorship, uh, connecting them uh, with, with good role models, particularly female 
uh, role models, teachers in their communities, uh, also uh, working with elders and, 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 and others who hold the power in, in, in communities. Uh, at the household level, uh, fathers have a huge say about whether a young girl would go to school because it is believed that she should either be living with her father or with her husband. And so shifting these norms and shifting these mindsets uh, has been one of the things that we've been trying to do. Uh, we have an interesting model uh, in Kenya, the girl model, that uh, we are working uh, with our partners, Masiko, uh, in northern Kenya, just to increase uh, the capabilities of young girls and young women uh, to build the resilience within their household, and particularly because many of them have already been married or quite young, and they already have children even before they hit 20. And so working within communities to just shift this uh, norms, and particularly because the young girls are also very much interested in going back to school. So facilitating for them to go to school begins to shift uh, such norms uh, within communities when the girls are able then uh, to go back to school and, and acquire their, uh, their qualifications. Thank you very much. I just wanted to, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I wanted to add something else. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is responding to this question and also kind of like responding to Krista Jacobs in question about uh, gender issues in, in the agriculture sector. In Guatemala, in, historically, it's, it's, well, it's, be, it's well known that uh, agriculture is only, it, it can, can only be done to, for, for men, and that's the general perception. And one of the things that we have been doing through the PD Future Activity is the implementation of this strategy, which is the uh, of this uh, tool, which is the uh, learning path, and as I mentioned before, and each uh, uh, each each learning each learning path has several stations, and what we're trying to do is that we in involve both men and women into each activity, so they basically learn what the activities that usually men will do, so also now uh, women will do it as well, and so that it's been very uh, I would say it's been a very good example for how to involve. Uh, involve uh, gender. And also, uh, I think one of the things I've heard from our implementer partners in the last few months is that given the uh, COVID-19, uh, so now men are staying more at home and that, uh, that kind of like involves them into more uh, uh, home activities. And that's something that we are, I would say, taking advantage of this momentum through the, through the uh, nutrition center and cultural activities, trying to involve men as well into all the uh, let's say like just for making more balanced food, and that's one of the trainings they're trying to implement, and so men they are learning this kind of activities now. Thank you very much from our panelists for that uh, answer for that question. Um, the next question comes from Manohara Kadka, uh, and it's to Agnes. It's on um, the private sector is gender exclusive in terms of understanding value chain and inclusive food systems. Are there examples from where we can learn from private sector actors being inclusive, both in their organizational system, policies, and interventions? Great. Thank you for this question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Um, so I'd like to start by um, maybe dispelling a little myth that the private sector only refers to big business. Um, the private sector in most countries is composed of small and medium scale enterprises. And that is, I think, where um, progress on inclusion um, can, can begin or where, where you can make the most progress to start, you know, start with the grassroots. So, for example, um, I think there is, there is enough evidence that women entrepreneurs face a lot of barriers in, in terms of access to capital, in terms of access to labor. Um, they often start out with lower levels of um, human capital schooling experience than men. At the same time, I also want to point out that um, we shouldn't see entrepreneurship as a panacea for everything because um, for example, um, under USAID support, we did, we did a study of uh, women's empowerment in value chains in, in Bangladesh. And what we found was that, in fact, it's the women producers, so those who are farmers, who are actually more empowered than the women entrepreneurs because the entrepreneurs tended to be 
um, they tended to be located in enterprises that were very small, very trade focused, and with very limited value added. So they were low value enterprises. So what's the implication here? If if you want the private sector, private small scale entrepreneurs to um, to succeed and for the food systems to be more inclusive, you really have to start at the bottom and try to make sure that men and women, disadvantaged groups, marginalized groups, have access to the and control of the means of production that they can use for these enterprises. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for our next question, uh, it's to uh, Maitre. Uh, it's Abdu Bashir. Is, his question, or the question is, is economic marginalization exclusion linked to violence or civil unrest? Can exclusion be a tool for political gains or inclusion? That's an excellent question. It's actually a very complex one. Um, there, there isn't any linear path between exclusion and political violence. Because political violence is comes from a number of different um, ways, a number of different processes and historical and other other circumstances. Um, for instance, pol political violence could also be between two fairly equal groups. But I do want to take on board a, 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 a misperception that exclusion is only of minority groups. Quite often, and we call this elite capture in other other ways, in, in other contexts, is that often there are minority groups that take control of the political system. And it is the vast majority that is excluded. Quite sometimes it could be even a minority ethnic group that is that is ruling and, and is centralizing power. So I think that there there are many nuances to the ways in which exclusion and political violence are related. Um, the other point that I wanted to make was generally about violence as a tool of exclusion. Now, violence, as, as I pointed out, there are many structures and processes through which exclusion is solidified. And violence is one of the most gruesome tools through which exclusion is, is uh, solidified and certain groups are so-called kept in their place through violence. So it's not just violence, but it's also the threat of violence. Um, and it doesn't happen just in the political sphere. It happens in the household sphere. It happens in the community sphere. It happens in many other ways. So in answer to that question, there are, so I have a twofold answer. One is that yes, it could be related to exclusion, but there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation. And second, that that power tends to be can be centralized by small groups, and they could use violence as a tool. And finally, that violence is often a tool and a very extreme tool to solidify exclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, a question for Emmanuel. Um, this comes from Mary Crave. Uh, she asks. How has the involvement of youth been received in Rwanda? Are they treated as equals with adults, dismissed as being inexperienced and naive, encouraged? What platform do they have to be heard in program design and implementation? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, no, Marie, uh, some of you know Rwanda, uh, no inequality between women, between men. Uh, because in Rwanda uh, this time the wives are well treated, not only uh, in the seed production because someone who asked this question was mentioning uh, 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 how the wives are treated by the, their husband, but really uh, the, the progress about this is everlasting. The wives are well treated by their husband because the agriculture is bringing them the income because uh, uh, upon this job they are doing, they are making the money, first of all, someone who are producing the seeds, are generating the money, and also others uh, who are getting the job as manpower, as manpowers, also they are making the money from this job. So uh, there is no inequality uh, within or 
among husband and wives, the things are well. Okay, um, moving on to the next question is, this question is for Betty from Elizabeth uh, Waitahanji. Uh, what adjustments were made in the Kenyan markets to include people with different disabilities? Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for these important questions. Uh, the market infrastructure has been quite friendly uh, to persons living with disabilities uh, because it does include ramps as well as rails, uh, but also the market infrastructure generally uh, does not have multiple steps uh, that would you know, hinder particularly persons with physical disabilities from being able to access and utilize the market. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, here's another question from uh, Indra Pine. Throughout course of programs and their implementation, was there any pushback? How were they addressed and women further motivated? Um, this is for uh, anyone or maybe Manju first. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, of course. Manju? <laughs> yeah. Yep. The pushbacks come, usually can come from internal uh, to the organization. And this, this can be a, a very, you know, um, vivid reality. Um, when people who are managing the projects um, aren't sufficiently convinced about um, the imperative for inclusion or empowerment, then, um, or when the partners are not able to understand fully the rationale for or the benefits for inclusion, then uh, there, there will be resistances. Um, the best way would be to talk with, engage with your partners, to engage with your team, um, to, to do the, uh, you know, um, advocacy, um, internal advocacy, in, um, and, uh, and communicate. Um, I would say um, these are important, but yes, there will be resistances, not because people really want to say, I don't like inclusion, but because people have not understood. People have not, you know, people come from different backgrounds. So they, they are so much uh, um, sector oriented or background oriented or, you know, discipline oriented. So you need to also be open to understand the pushbacks. Where is it coming from? And uh, what are the apprehensions? Sometimes people are very much afraid of failures of, you know, uh, working with marginalized people. It, you need to provide a lot of support and facilitation, and you have to do a lot of engagement and collaboration around it. And uh, it doesn't guarantee success. Uh, so you have to have, have the, uh, you know, ability to take the risk. And people are, people are apprehensive, and, you know, people keep on pushing it. You know, they want to go to the lower hanging fruit. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from the panel like to add? No? Yes, um, I would like to mention the. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that one of the uh, activities that we are promoting under the City Future activities is the uh, new masculinity strategy. It's just a way to involve both men and women into the same activities so that both sides can get uh, knowledge of what we are doing, but at the same time they are getting more conscious that both, both sides can actually do those activities in the same way and they can earn the same knowledge and the same, and can have access to the same financial or economic opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Ajay. Uh, are there problems with child labor in your country? If yes, how are you addressing it? Uh, this could be to uh, maybe Maitre first and then uh, others could answer. Um, on, on child labor, um, I mean, in terms of, I, I won't be able to answer specific to countries, but uh, 
but in general, I, I think that this is something, you know, it's a certainly part of the ILO convention that most countries have signed up to, uh, which requires kids to be in school until a certain age and then um, and then be able to, and then uh, after that they can be they can go to work. It you know it's a form of exclusion that keeps children out of school, but it is also a mechanism by which um, especially poor families maximize family labor uh, in contexts where schooling is not available, other kinds of uh, livelihoods are not available. So addressing child labor is a much more complex endeavor that requires both the existence of schools but also the existence of livelihoods for families that then deploy the labor of their children. That's over to you. Uh, does anyone else on the panel have uh, anything to add to that on how they're approaching this challenge? Let me just uh, just add also from Kenya that the issue of child labor is um, it's very much um, a reality uh, here, particularly because of uh, the persistent poverty that we see among our people and because systems have failed in many places uh, so that you have a, a high rate of dropout uh, and transition. Uh, children who are not able to transition from the primary level onto the second level, then we, we lose a lot of children uh, through that. Uh, and also because of the way of life, uh, you'll find that many families uh, like um, my fellow panelists mentioned uh, are relying on, on family labor and so you'll find children uh, you know being pulled out of school or sometimes if a family has to make decisions uh, you'll find that a decision may be made for one or the other child to be dropped out of school and therefore they find themselves engaging in child labor uh, we are we, in Kenya we have been seeing a trend uh, where we have a lot of young boys uh, dropping out of school uh, and engaging in multiple activities, whether they are agricultural activities or pastoral activities or also economic activities like engaging in, um, in, uh, in the transport sector. And so this continues to be a real challenge uh, in our country. Of course, uh, there are legal uh, provisions that, uh, you know, outlaw child labor. But then again, also you have the dynamics of poverty. Uh, playing uh, into all these. Uh, we, we found in our gender analysis that the younger uh, a woman is, and so young women are particularly vulnerable also, uh, because if they are married off early, then now are you looking at them as a child or are you looking at them uh, as somebody's wife, and therefore they are engaging in labor. So all these dynamics uh, begin to, uh, to, to just complicate and compound the issue of child labor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a question from Josue Lopez uh, to Agnes. What recommendations are coming from the field to reduce the practice of giving young girls in marriage? Any data on the reduction of this practice? Sure. Um, there are a number of very interesting interventions to help to reduce um, the age at marriage for young girls. The, the first one, actually, is something that isn't um, doesn't need to be as specifically uh, for small-scale intervention. The most important one is to keep girls in school because if you are able to keep girls in school, that helps, that tends to reduce marriage age. And some programs have been looking at things like um, conditional cash transfer programs to keep girls in school. That's quite, um, that's quite common. Others would have a conditional... Um, asset transfer programs, so for example, giving goats to parents so that they um, keep the girls in school at least in, until age 18. I think India just had one where they where um, there were cash transfers made to the girls' bank account as long as she stayed in school until she was 18. So there are there are a number of um, of of programs which try to do this. Some of them are actually quite um, targeted to specific contexts where girls may face specific vulnerabilities. So for example, giving adolescents safe spaces to gather so that they don't engage in um, 
risky sexual activity and therefore risk, run the risk of getting pregnant and dropping out. Okay, thank you. Um, we're nearing the end of our webinar, so uh, I would like to give the panelists and our presenters an opportunity to give a few short remarks uh, if they feel the, the desire to, um, based on the presentations and Q&As uh, that they've experienced over the course of this webinar. Um. Um, can I start? This is Agnes. Sure, go ahead, Agnes. Um, I just wanted to say that I was really inspired and enriched by all the presentations from the field because um, I'm a researcher, and researchers try to find out what works, but we're not the ones who are actually implementing and facing um, all the challenges on the ground. So congratulations to our colleagues from the field, and I think that working together with evidence, uh, evidence, data, and experience, we can help to have a more inclusive food system and world in general. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, can, yep. I, uh, can I just add to that, please? Uh, yes, please. So I, I also, in fact, um, Agnes uh, said, said this ahead of me, but I really enjoyed the other panelists' uh, presentations and also the questions because uh, what the questions did was to bring out the many, many ways in which exclusion plays out. And, and each of the questions was so central to uh, what the, the participants were personally uh, grappling with in their work. So, um, you know, having that, so, so I mean, exclusion is just so context specific that to be able to apply these frameworks that we build to actual real life issues is, uh, is extremely heartening. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, any member of our panelists, Betty, would you have any closing comments? Yes, thank you very much to all who are able to attend and join us for this uh, very uh, enriching uh, discussion. And to my fellow panelists, thank you for all the knowledge that we brought uh, forward. We thank you all for your great participation. Uh, I think we are much more inclusive uh, with this presentation. Thank you. Uh, Manju? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your valuable time. I just want to say that uh, inclusion um, is very much possible. The change of social norms is very much possible. And remember that gender norms can be changed first by, you know, by the family. And for inclusion, uh, institution is the most important thing. So setting the institutions right and, you know, checking our own beliefs and values. Um, it has to start from there. Um, I, I believe there will be always be, uh, you know, positive pathways um, ahead for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Arson, do you have uh, any parting words for us? We might get back to him. He think might have uh, computer need uh, issues. Uh, Emmanuel, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm there. So I would like really to thank you. Do you have any closing words for us? Yeah, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to share with you our experience. So uh, we are really welcome you in our country to see what you are doing. And uh, I thank uh, Mr. Lafayette, who really helped me to get well linked with uh, webinar. And I uh, hope next time we are meeting, and I wish that we can, we, we can open up the partnership with Oreco, which is uh, an, an organization of young engineers in agriculture and who are struggling for uh, 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 pu putting more in, more efforts in agriculture to develop it themselves and also to develop the whole country as well as the world. Thank you very much. Okay.
Thank you, everyone. Um, I think we're still having challenges with uh, Grace Ontario. Um, I appreciate everyone's participation today. Uh, we had nearly 300 participants uh, joining us from across the globe. Uh, thank you all very much for your time in you know, joining this webinar on why inclusion matters, uh, featuring voices from the field. Uh, if you wouldn't take a, a moment before you uh, leave us today and head off on you know, the rest of your day, morning, or evening, uh, if you wouldn't take time to fill out the polls that we have uh, on your screen, um, we will be uh, sharing out. You'll also find the um, files for download for today's presentation deck. That's on the left. And then additional links uh, that are useful uh, down on the lower left as well. Um, we do take your feedback seriously, so we appreciate um, you taking a few moments to um, fill them out uh, and suggest how we can improve the uh, webinars and how we, you know, share knowledge uh, in the future uh, in our suggestion box down below. And with that, again, I thank our presenters and speakers today for um, sharing their experiences and their knowledge. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us today and providing such a rich discussion uh, via the chat box and asking such excellent questions. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day.